Revelation chapter 1 from verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Oh, that's it. I want to give you some context to that thought. Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you. Dispensation of the grace of God given to me, Paul. For who? For you. Now let's see what's given to Paul. Verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore, I wrote before in few words. Verse 4, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in what? In the mystery of Christ. So what was given to Paul? The revelation of Christ. We call it the doctrine of Christ. Amen? The revelation of who? Of Christ. There's a Christ-level revelation. Amen? Then there's a God-level revelation. Are, you, are we together, please? I said there's a what? A Christ-level revelation. And there's a what? There's a God-level revelation. Also, there's a Holy Ghost-level revelation. It's called milk. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world. So when we get born again, the first level of revelation we come into is the milk of the world. Milk of the world, where they teach us faith towards God. There are many preachers who have done an outstanding job on milk of the world. One of such, chief of all, Kenneth Higgin. Baba Higgin. And you can even en enrich yourself in many of the books he has written as such. Some of the books are like Believer's Authority. Zoe, the God kind of life. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you saying that? Those are the books I read that really, how to train the human spirit. Jesus. I, you, some of you need, those, you need to go back to those books, please. I encourage you. In fact, I'm using one of his books for SLC right now. Love, the way to victory. Amen. That man, they call him the father of the word of faith movement. He has hundreds of books. The, the two that really, or two or three that really transformed my Christianity and my hunger was Believer's Authority, number one. That's number, number two was, what's the one I just mentioned again? Zoe, the God kind of life. That thing instilled a seed in me that I've not recovered from to today. Zoe means life. That's what instilled the seeds of my pursuit for eternal life. Do you get me? After a while, people are calling Brother James of Life. Now you people going, Pastor James of Eternal Life. <laughs> so no, my ministry is called Eternal Life Ministry. That thing, I was not, I was drunk. I, I could I never recover. <laughs> I just never recover. There's a this you just never recover from. I never recover after that. That God really wants to give me this eternal life. First to my spirit. Ah, fear God, oh. His life. It could be God kind of life. His own life. Sometimes we need to hear these things. We don't know these things. His own life, not another person's life. He didn't make eternal life. He lives by eternal life. He is eternal life. The Bible says this is the one true God and eternal life. Then John 17, 3 says this is how, this is how you, this is life eternal definition. To know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So it means you need the revelation of Christ and then the revelation of God. To have eternal life. You need what? The revelation of what? Christ and the revelation of God to have eternal life. This is Bible. God's life is not cheap, man. I'm sorry. You just don't go and buy it in the market. <laughs> Praise God. He chased two people out of the Garden of Eden because of this life. You think you just wake up in the morning and have eternal life? Ah, no. There's protocol. There's process. 
Let's go to that John 17 tree. Scriptures are just beginning to blast on me today. Yeah. Maybe the snow is actually reflecting in the spirit. Waters of living water flowing. Just that it, as it was flowing as waters of living water, Edmonton is cold. It now froze the water. It now turned into snow. <laughs> So, for adventure, if we had a day like this in June, it would just be an outpouring of rain. You get what I mean? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Read for me John 17, 3. I need a reader. Then you can read it if you're there. And this is life eternal. That's that right. they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Amen. Remember, all of us, when you go to school, they say, this is biology. I won't forget the definition. Can somebody help me? What did they tell us? Study of what? Study of life. Biology. So definition. So this is physics. Physics is this. This is this. So Jesus wants to help you define eternal life. He's defining eternal life. This is life eternal. To what? To know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Two, revelation of the one true God and revelation of Christ. How are we together in the house? They gave to Paul the revelation of Christ. He took John in the book of Revelations to receive the revelation of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. It is not a blessing. The day you see this, you will see the book of Revelation with a different eye. That is actually a revelation of God. <laughs> it's not just scary. <laughs> Amen. It's like God purposely put the scary part so for people that if you're not serious, we go in. Remember when the children of Israel, God told the children of Israel they should come and meet me on the third day in Mount, on the mountain. Moses go and prepare them. When they were now coming on the third day, they heard thunder, fire. And Chris said, Moses, please, have extra. My heart can't handle it. Please, you go. <laughs> go and meet with God. Discuss with him. And come and tell us the feedback. God surrounds himself with such scary stuff. For inside it, is the understanding of his person. If he gives you the eyes for it. But before that, there's an understanding called the mystery of Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. There's an understanding called what? Called the mystery of Christ. And that one was given to Paul. Amen. That one was given to who? To Paul. Paul wrote to thirds of the New Testament because he was endowed with the mystery of Christ. Oh, Jesus. We spend most of our teachings in the mystery of Christ. Let me even come lower a bit. Let me come lower. Remember, I told you before even Christ, there's the revelation of milk that the Holy Ghost unveils. You see that demonstration before Paul started, really, in Romans. What was, what was the book before Romans? Acts of the Apostles. What happened in Acts of the Apostles? Holy Ghost. <laughs> if you want to define Acts of the Apostles, Holy Ghost. Pentecost. It came down as tongues of fire. They began to speak in new tongues. Amen. Then the believers began to increase. Faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all, this, unto all the saints. They began to love one another. They began to share their stuff. They began to start bringing their things to the apostles and began to share, feast together, do house fellowships. They are the author of house fellowship. <laughs> Amen. It started in Acts of the Apostles. Holy Ghost. That was the betting. And in the Holy Ghost, they will now teach you how to start believing God. How to start loving one another. 
Believing God for physical things. Believing God for things that before you use your labor, you use your senses, you use your mind, you use your calculation, you use everything that in your own brain to try and calculate and mean and scheme to get. But now there's another method where you can add faith and believe God. <laughs> believe God that he will make a way for you. That you will be okay. That he will provide. That he will heal. That that job you're looking for, you will get it. That's what the Holy Ghost came to do. To reassure us. To know that God actually loves you. God actually wants you to have good things. Do you get what I mean? Just that better things are of God than of physical. Am I going to get it? God actually wants to have good things, but he knows the best things are his. Not just food to eat. The best things are who he is. The best things are his creative powers. The best things are his divine power. The best things are eternal power. The best things of life are from him, of him, and by him. He knows. How would I know this simply? The Bible says all things were made by him, by the word. Without him was nothing made that was made. Now, the things made can be a blessing, but the one who made the things made is better of a blessing. Hey. The source of making things is more blessed than the thing he made. So all the clarion call, God is begging us, come and hear my word. My word, the thing that you are pursuing, my word made it. The thing that you desire the most and you are killing yourself over, why you will not come to church for, is the, the word that made the thing that you are not coming to church for. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made. Nothing. Nothing. Praise the name of the Lord. So are you seeing how the, the Bible is a skill set from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to Acts of the Apostles. Talking about the move of the Holy Ghost. You know, most of Jesus' walk, at least the day walk, was all milk of the world. It was his night walk that he went into to start dealing with his father. But most of his operations, because there was nobody who could understand his mystery at the time. Nobody, including his disciples. <laughs> Do you know Jesus' greatest suffering was not just that the Romans could kill him or the Pharisees hated him. His greatest suffering was that nobody, even the people around him that he would sleep on the same bed with, understood him. The Bible says it. I'll, say, I'll tell you what Jesus himself said, but the book of Hebrews says he will suffer great contradictions of sinners among himself. Like it means he was surrounded with sinners. Peter, James, John, all of them. He was surrounded with sinners. Not even talk of the other ones, the Pharisees. Then Jesus says, foxes have their holes. Birds have their nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I've heard some preachers that will preach, yes, that he, slept, he was born in a manger. After that, Jesus had places to sleep. I'm sorry, he was not homeless. <laughs> they don't understand what that means. In that Jesus, I will tell the disciples, Peter, and you sent to go to that person's house, tell him that we're going to stay there for the night. They always had a place to stay. That was not the issue, apart from when he was born. So it's not a physical bed that he was complaining about. It's not a physical bed. Foxes have their holes. Beds have their nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What that means spiritually is that nobody can understand my mind. Nobody can relate with my mind. I have nowhere. I don't have a supporter in my ministry. They are just following me because of signs and wonders. 
they don't actually have, for example, to support Jesus' ministry means you'll be preparing him for his death. Whereas rather they were fighting him against dying and denying him. <laughs> to support somebody's ministry, to support their vision, we need to know whom we have believed because in the absence of the knowledge of God, issue, the devil, will package another kind of knowledge that you will not be able to resist. Am I communicating? You will not be able to resist it. Let me, let me, let me tell you something a bit more. Remember, the gift of God is without repentance, right? You should go and read what God said when he made Lucifer. Perfect in beauty. Beauty actually means everlasting strength. Stature. Perfect in beauty. Full of wisdom. I remember the gift of God is without repentance. So who are we dealing with? Somebody who is, has a false perfection and a darkened wisdom. But darkened wisdom is still wisdom. <laughs> Amen? Am I getting? Darkened wisdom is still what? And false perfection is still a form of perfection. So without mighty true God, for the pulling down of strongholds. Without God, you cannot defeat this guy. The weapons of warfare are not canal, but mighty true. So you need true God to pull these things down. If you don't do it through God, you will not pull these things down. Can we go to that scripture? Let's, let's see what, how true God. God explains himself there. How true God. I think 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not what carnal. What verse? Verse 4. Verse 4, okay. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. And In the strongholds, what, what, what are they there for? To stand against the knowledge of God. That's what they don't want you to have. Because having the knowledge of God is tantamount to having eternal life. It's, co it's directly correlated for you getting the life of God. So they stand, meaning they cast out imaginations that keep you in pursuit of other knowledges, but the knowledge of God. That keeps you in chase of other knowledges, what? But the knowledge of God. That keep you testy for other knowledges, what, but, but the knowledge of God. That keep you chasing other experiences, but the knowledge of God. Mighty true God. So how is it mighty true God? How will God help you pull down the stronghold? You can tell me. How? How would he do it? How would he pull down the stronghold? They say mighty true God. By feeding you with his knowledge. That's what the enmity is against. Knowledge versus knowledge. Knowledge of imaginations. Wrong imaginations. Perfect in beauty knowledge. Full of wisdom knowledge. So it will take the only wise God to break full of wisdom. Am I communicating? Oh, glory to God. Huh? It's wisdom versus wisdom. Meaning knowledge versus knowledge. So mighty true God. He would take, it's not a prayer. We are prayed it. It won't work. I'm not swearing for you. It will not work. <laughs> because they don't cast themselves against your prayer. They don't exalt themselves against your praise. They don't exalt yourself, themselves against your worship. They don't exalt themselves against your act of service. They exalt themselves against you knowing God. So if you want to pull down that stronghold, you have to know your God. You have to come under revelation like Mary chose. And one thing is needful. Mary has chosen it and it shall not be taken from her. 
because you chose the right thing. Everything else centers around that. Do you know your prayer life will improve when you know God? I know it now. Me, I've been there before. Do nine feet. Imagine I'll do a whole nine feet praying against my enemies. Father, Father, blast them. Every uncle, every auntie from my village that has planned evil against my family in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I've been there, done that. Yeah. God, God now taught me one day. Don't ever be angry with people. Be angry with the spirit. If I now kill all your uncles, the spirit that troubled the whole family will find another distant uncle to still find. Enter and come and disturb you. <laughs> so you have to kill your whole clan <laughs> to be free. <laughs> Judge the spirit that is inside that ancestry. Not the men who have agreed with the spirit. Go, let God judge them. He would take the revelation of God to break every stronghold in your life permanently because the gift of God is without repentance. Once you know, you know. The Holy Spirit once taught me this thing is like learning to drive a car. I remember, the Holy Spirit taught me a, 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 a teaching. He says, walking with me is like learning to drive a car. Before you know how to drive a car, you are so scared that you will have an accident, that you will crash, that this will happen, that will happen. But the moment you master how to drive the car, you know how to drive forever. You don't have to go to driving school twice. Not so. You have it, you have it. That's the same thing with knowledge. You have it, you have it. Some of us, let's say you are a nurse here. You went to school four years for nursing. Do you have to do another four years in the future? You have it, you have it. You just continue and, and grow on, on it. That's how knowledge is like. So once you know God and have grown to break strongholds, it's permanent. That's permanent deliverance. Yeah. That's how it happens. That's permanent deliverance. Let me finish that scripture you see. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself exalts against, the knowledge, itself of against God. the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity mm. every thought to every the obedience thought. of Christ. To the obedience. So what are, these, what are the issues here? Thoughts. They, now, they are revealing it more and more. The strongholds are thoughts. You have belief systems that are wrong. The only way to break it is to teach the person, break the thought by bringing forth God's own thoughts on that topic. You know, Satan is a strong man. Jesus says no one breaks into a strong man's and spoils his goods except you first bind the strong man. Do you know who is talking? Who was saying that? A strong man. A stronger man. <laughs> the guy who has we call, we call it expo expo means you have inside information the guy who has the inside information of how to beat a stronger man sorry a weak a weak a strong man but who is weaker than him amen it means that do you know when you are in God's kingdom if Satan wants to get you what Jesus is saying it works both ways Satan has to go to the throne of God Bind God up before he can get you. Good luck. Oh, that's what I just said to you. Good luck. Bon chance. <laughs> but, I, I mean, Lucifer will just be behaving like this a little bit. The one who sits on, before he could reach it, I will have said to the star, he just open. I, <laughs> It comes in the whole time. But Charles, you look good, try. <laughs> but we serve a mighty God. Whew, Jesus, I need, I need to describe this to you. you know, the mentor is taking me there. Let's go, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You will see what this stronger man did for us. Ephesians chapter 4. Praise the name of the Lord. Woo, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. From verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. 
now that now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first mm -hmm. into the lower parts into of the, the earth? Into the lower parts of the earth. What is he saying there? Remember when Jesus died on the cross? He went to the lower parts of the earth, meaning he went to hell. I don't know if you know that. When Jesus died on the cross, after he gave up the ghost and blood and water gushed up, he went to hell. The Bible says, who, he who had no sin became sin. And what the sinners go? Hell. He went to the lowest parts of hell for our sake. Verse 8, this is wherefore he said, when he ascended up high, he led captivity captive. captive. Meaning, who was captivity? Men in hell. Yes. He went and captivated them. And they became his captives. The Bible says he led the train out of hell. He preached the first gospel in hell. That's the first place they preached Jesus. Some of those men of old. You know, before, because of no Jesus, they couldn't make heaven. He may have seen some of those great men of old. Jerusalem had there. Those men who have served God. But because he was not no Christ, they still had to go there. Jesus would have ministered to them. And they believed. Their gates poor. The first Paul and Silas happened in hell. The gates shattered, broke open. Then he led, he led the train. Captivity captive. Took them out. Satan is finished in your life. I say he entered the chamber. He scattered their king. So if you want, if, see, the only, see, See, how it now works now, the only people that don't want to come out are the people who chose not to come out. That's the only way. So now Satan has to do double de deception upon deception so that you will choose not to come out. Lies. But if you choose, yeah, but if you choose, you say, I won't follow God. I want to follow God. I, I choose God. Satan cannot stop you. He can't. He can try. Maybe he'll try and make you sick. But sickness is temporary. It will pass. Try and make you struggle small. It will still pass. But I will follow God. He can't stop that. He will never stop it. Ever since that day, the kingdom of God suffered violent, and the violent took it by force. <laughs> do you know how they don't try to do and stop Christianity? Even from the beginning. Immediately, Listen for say, yeah, hey, we made mistake. Oh. Hey, hey, what shall we do now? But Lucifer, because he's excellent in beauty, perfect in wisdom, full of wisdom, he doesn't give up. Yeah, let's go back to the earth. Let's go back to the earth. Let's go and hunt down everybody who believes in him. Let's go. Yeah, let's go, guys. Guys, we cannot just lose the battle like that. They've already lost it. But we cannot just go like that. We can't go down without a fight. So now come. Oh yeah, Pharisees, my sons and daughters. <laughs> Begin to persecute them. Begin to punish them. Begin to flog them. Because you cannot touch your spirit anymore. The only thing you can beat is your body. Are you saying that? That's why they went to physical blows. Because they can't touch, they can't stop you spiritually anymore. The enemy cannot stop you feel spiritually anymore. It's only you that can stop yourself. Am I communicating? Let me, let me make it so practical. Who can stop you from coming here on a Saturday morning? Only you can stop yourself. Do you know the best the enemy can do? Let 50 centimeters of snow fall so you will feel depressed so you don't come. That's the best he can do. But if you still decide to come in spite of the snow, he cannot stop you. I see how it works. I'm trying to make it practical. He can do some, you know, do some skill sets and some, I don't know, witchcraft and some, some schemings around your life. He just to make you feel like your life is not moving forward. To make you feel like you are down, you are depressed. That maybe God is not on your side. Maybe this is not going to work. That's the best he can do. But if in spite of all those is drama and all those is movie, he still decides, you still decide, I will still follow God. There's nothing he can do about it. That's a beating man. I love that song. Death could not hold him. Satan is a beating man. 
You are the one that needs to exercise it in your life. Exercise the victory that Christ has given you in your life. Why? Because Satan, the devil is a beaten man. So the what's left is to lie, to deceive, to scheme around you. Make you feel like things are not working. Make you feel like nobody likes you. He's a liar. He's just finished. Sometimes, you know, I used to abuse and beat him. He even made me feel that God does not like me. There was a season in my life when God was taking me through wilderness. Remember, I told you apostles will suffer. When I was going through my Asia experience, my wilderness experience. So I thought, you know, when you come, people are giving testimony. Everybody just giving testimony. For months, you don't have any testimony. <laughs> <laughs> you will search your mind. You will check everywhere. There's nothing to write home about. Nothing positive is happening. So, <laughs> so I now use wisdom. I say, hey. So God, you're not answering my prayer. You see, you're not answering my prayer. So I'll go and select some people who are giving many testimony. I'll go and meet them. I say, can you help me pray to God? It looks like God is not answering my prayer. <laughs> so in a season, it felt as though the enemy has convinced me that God doesn't actually like me. That maybe I'm doing too much. Maybe I'm doing too much. Maybe, I'm, maybe I won't miss it. That's how you went right in your wilderness experience. You, everybody feels that way at some point. Yeah. Then one day, in the spirit, I had an encounter with the Lord. <laughs> that, the encounter was tense because I was feeling like, you don't like me. You have not done anything in my life that is worth holding. And as I was beginning to almost complain, I just decided in my heart, I say, you know what? I won't conclude. I know you don't like me. But me, I like you. And we'll wear the same trouser. If you like, don't like me, that's your own. <laughs> but me, I like you. And we're going to be here. We'll die here together. That was the end of that battle. You know, it was a Satan just skimming things. You break his walls. You shatter his glass. <laughs> when, when you prove to him that despite his scheming, you are still going to chase God. Though yet you slay me, yet I will trust in you. Yet I will trust in you. Now, I've, I was one of those people who was, I was so afraid of the book of Job. Because, you know, Job, you know, sometimes, you know, that's, you know that fear that if you open something that you don't want, the thing will come to pass. <laughs> right? So let's stay away from Job because I don't want to suffer what Job suffered. Please. I'm just a boy. <laughs> I beg. <I> just can't. <laughs> so, I said, <laughs> So for the longest time, I was not reading the book of Job. And the funny thing is that when you don't, when you are trying to avoid something, you always be seeing it. You every time you want to go to Psalm, somehow the Bible will open to Job. I'm going, ah, <laughs> let's go to the book of Psalms instead. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> After one day, the Lord said, "Okay, this one you have to be seated." And how you used to, you used to track it, track me down in Job. You know. The book, book proverb says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In the book of Job, it said it differently. It says the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. That thing got me curious. Why did Job say that? So he began to draw me back. I had to go back and start studying the book of Job. And as I was studying the book of Job, I now realized that the blessing that God was giving Job, even while he was in the midst of pain and suffering, he has never given to any man before in the Bible. I never get any money for him. What did we say pulls down strongholds? The knowledge of God. What did you say leads to life? The knowledge of God. Why Job? Go and read it. From I think from the verse 36, 7, 8, 9, all of that. Why Job was in all the excruciating, was in that place of being scattered. The Lord was talking to him directly, not through a prophet. Remember, this is Old Testament. Not to Isaiah, not to Jeremiah, not to Ezekiel. My God, the Lord was raw talking to him. 
describing creation to me. His personality. His person. I say, fear God. That is more blessing than the blessing I think he lost. After the Lord finished speaking, Job went on his knees. <laughs> and say, he repented and said, I'm not a righteous man. When God described to him his real righteousness, Job said, I'm not righteous. You are the righteous one. I say, oh, so all this treasure has been in Job. And I'll be running away from it. Blessings. Oh my God. The wisdom behind creation, he gave, he gave it to Job. He ministered it to Job. And that was comfort and solace in a time of pain. Me that knows what, how sweet revelation is, I can imagine Job. After a while, not to remember I'm going through anything. <laughs> Let it be minus 50 and I'm outside. I will not feel like I'm minus 50. Because God is delivering fire and water to me. Praise the name of the Lord. So much. Are we blessed today? As we live here now, I know your hunger will go up. You understand? You have to carry that Bible you're holding and you have to read it. You have to listen to messages. You have to ask questions. And then you have to come back for fellowship and get some more. It's a new generation God is raising. God is raising up. I even mean, this God as I bring him back the apostolic again. You get He has started bringing it back again. That's why you see some of the most renowned men of God, now even from Africa and Nigeria, are, they are, are teaching again. Teaching doctrine again. Because it's God's mercy. Ten years ago, it was not so. Nobody knew them. Honestly, nobody knew them. Ten years ago. But they're coming up. Because God is seen and the church, the body knows. People know that they need more than what they are getting right now. It's, you get me? Milk is not enough. Am I communicating? You know what Jesus said? Jesus said the children of this world are wiser than his. They know how to grow faster by their revelation. So right now, the battle is unfair. Hello? Right now, the battle is unfair. Do you know what the battle is against? The battle is against Satan's sons versus God's babies. It's not a fair battle. It needs to be sons versus sons. Yes, that's why the church is weak. You get me? A balloon of babies. And whereas in this world, you are getting men who are mature in Satan's wisdom. Am I communicating? They've, they've developed in Satan's wisdom. That's what we are beginning to see in this world. And they know how to churn darkness and stay with it and maintain it. That sounds shit for you. Whereas we are just coming and somersaulting baby to baby. Rather than father to child, is child to child and baby to baby. That's why we are not winning the battle. But God has turned things around. The season has come and now it is. Where God say, you know, enough is enough. I'm going to start raising sons again. And the creation groaning. Because when you have sons of Satan, creation cries. Creation cries. We need to match this. Am I communicating? Have you noticed? If you notice some of these warfares, America will give Ukraine a next level generation weapon. Then people will now be saying, ah, that Ukraine is going to be winning. Then Russia will now bring out one new one again. Everybody now quiet again. Everybody now calm down. <laughs> Are you see that? Yeah, yeah. So Satan is releasing weapons of mass destruction, sons of darkness. It's time for God to respond with sons of God. And the problem, this is the problem. It's like the days of David. Come on. This is one son of God can scatter a thousand seven sons. Hallelujah. <laughs> I say one. 
How am I going to get it? You know, David was very son. He wanted to drink water. But it just so happens, unfortunately, that the water he wanted to drink was on the opposite side of where the army of his enemies were coming. The boys told him, sit down, sir. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> you sit down. You have tried. <laughs> sit down. We got this. Then they were got to go. The, the Bible actually began to record. One killed 883 men with his hands. The Lord God who teached my hands to fight and my fingers for battle. Another one killed 560 something. Another one killed 400. Is that like there was counting score of how many they killed with their bare hands. That water, they got it for David. Just water. Not even Israel. It's not land. It's water. So what, when they want now fight for Israel, how many do you think they will kill? And now Papa David will also stand up. <laughs> Am I communicating? One son of God, Paul, one son of God, killed the whole Roman Empire. How do I mean I killed them? They converted to Christianity. One son of God. They call it the Roman Catholic Church for a reason. One son of God. That's the power a son can have. <laughs> Set I can be dancing now yeah, with all his sons. We are coming. Eh? I said, we are coming. Oh, my Liga Bala. We are coming. Your seed shall inherit the Gentiles. You will dominate. You will take over. It doesn't mean just money and land. No. Influence. You will break things over lands. Nations begin to give their life to Jesus. Just, you are not going to preach to them because of your presence. He you begins to break things in the atmosphere. It's others who will do the evangelism. Pulling down strong. His spirit, falling spirits from heaven. No, there's been one spirit I've been fighting over Edmonton for 10 years now. It's called a pharaohic spirit. I feel it. Pharaoh, the spirit of Pharaoh in this province. I've been fighting it since. The first time I rec recognized it in the spirit was 2016. The spirit of Pharaoh. Labor. Because everybody is so laboring. Hard work. You just don't have physically exhausted to serve God. Physically incapable. By the time you walk, they walk you. You feel scattered. You feel empty. I say, ah. I've been fighting us for eight years. Uh, it seems to begin to crack. I say it will scatter in the mighty name of Jesus. When you break spirits over land, later on you start seeing the harvest. Because we are now free spiritually. Then evangelists will come and harvest them. That's what Paul, Paul entered Rome. Even if a, see, a prophet came to Paul, he this hand like so this is how, if you go to Jerusalem, because Paul knew you had to go to Jerusalem and then Rome. If you get to just this, how they will hold you and they will beat you up and they will arrest you. A prophet told Paul that, Agabus. Paul knew he was right, but Paul still went. These men, these are apostles. We do God's will. You obey the will of God. He knows he was going to Jerusalem. When he enters Jerusalem, he's going to suffer. But it's through Jerusalem he was going to end up in Rome. And God wanted him to get to Rome. So that they now arrested. So they arrested him. Once he told them, remember, some of you may not know the whole story, the context. Paul now, when they now arrested him and the Jews wanted to kill him and the Romans were not sure what to do with him, Paul now whispered to one of the Roman soldiers because God gave him wisdom. Say, I am a Roman citizen. So it means if you're a Roman citizen, they, cannot, they, 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 they ought not to try you based on Jewish customs. So they wanted to hand him over to the Jews. They couldn't hand him over to the Jews because he's a Roman citizen. So they don't have to try him in Rome. But you try Roman citizens in Rome. God has already arranged that. That's how Paul ended up in Rome. The moment he entered Rome, Rome was never the same again. He didn't have to preach to anybody in Rome. Much, just maybe some ladies or whatever. And was writing from Rome. Inside house arrest, he was writing letters to the Ephesians. Writing letters to the Corinthians. Writing letters. As he was writing letters and praying, spirits were falling. Spirits were falling. Before even Paul died, he began to see the effects of Christianity in Rome. That's why Nero, Nero became the emperor in the late 60s, uh, to, uh, 60 AD, 60 to 68 AD. Before Paul will die, the Christianity problem was such a big problem that Nero wanted to wipe it out. And in order to wipe it out, he started burning Christians alive, anyone he could catch, so he could discourage the others from 
becoming Christians. That, that's what, that tells you that the thing was becoming a wildfire in, the, in Rome. Something strange and something new was taking over Rome, even before he died. Even before he died. After he died, the thing continued. Then the emperor, Rome, all of them gathered and said, you know what? The Lord God shall be our God from now until forevermore. <laughs> One son. How many? One. One son of God. That's why in this kind of ministry, raising pillars, I don't look at numbers first. I said one son of God. How many are we here? One. Hey, Canada. If Canada knows what's going on, they will go. <laughs> the spirits of Canada. Hey. Ah. They are finished. One son of God scattered the whole Roman Empire. It takes time. It just takes years, that's all. And a thousand years is like a day. Check us, check this city out in five years. You'll not recognize it. He says, Is this the same place that's called the dead minting? <laughs> Wildfire of the Holy Ghost is blasting in different places. Uncontrollably. We will not even know the some of the places it's coming from. Because we brought down spirits from their edge. That's why. That's why you need sons of God. Babies will not know. They just come and sat down. So I pray, I love the Lord. I don't know his sons have brought some things down. Some of us, in God's generals, there was a guy called uh, Father Nash. Who was the guy with him? John Wesley. John Wesley is one of those, those great, uh, they call it um, Methodist. He's one that brought the wave called Methodist Church. So wherever John Wesley goes, there will be thousands of people give their life to Jesus. Thousands in America thousands and you stand on a stool and just start preaching but there was another man called father nash who used to follow john wesley not that they even knew each other just go holy spirit put it in father nash that wherever john wesley is to go six months before go and pray over that place so father nash will go and pray and pray and pray then he will go and he will leave nobody knows father nash even got there and left then just Wesley will come six months later and there's harvest. To <laughs> uh, so the God General's book, we put John Wesley as the God General. But there's a general above him, is Father Nash. Father Nash is the one who said, Give me Scotland or I die. <laughs> that was his prayer. How many of us have prayed that prayer before? Give me Canada or I die. We are not pretty. You don't want to die. <laughs> you don't want to die. <laughs> he said, give me Scotland or I die. There are, many, there are ministers of gospel, Victoria Reigns, I know, has went to his, the church in Scotland. Don't see you can went there because they want to go and tap. They want to go. Yeah, they want to also be. They went there. Give me Scotland or I die. And God did it. There was a move of God in Scotland. Praise God. God is, God is waiting on you. God is waiting on you. The Lord is trusting on you that you will step up. Don't have to do much. Just know your God. Pull down the strongholds. Revelation chapter 1 from verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Who gave it to him? So whose revelation is it? It's God. What did they give to Paul? Christ. What did they give to John? God. No wonder they call him John the Beloved. No wonder Jesus says, if I wish that he lives, he stays till I come back. What is it to you? Yeah. God gave him the book of life. The revelation of God. The revelation of Jesus which God gave unto him. Now pause. Let's go to another. I just want to show. One more witness there. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. And I read in KJV. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, one, and of the Father, two, and of Christ, three. There are three different mysteries. So in God, there's God and Father. They, that's what they call him. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, that's two dimensions of God. 
in these three mysteries, he now said, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That there is eternal life. To have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For you have to journey through the mystery of Christ and then to Father and God to get them. So the, uh, the epistles, somebody say the epistles, I'm rounding up. Somebody say again, the epistles. <laughs> They're written for you to understand the mystery of Christ. Praise God. Now, I'll give you another in, inside information. The reason why you must, not me, you must journey through the mystery of Christ first is because the mystery of Christ deals with our personalities, with our person, our bad behavior, bad habits that God cannot accept. So they wash you through Christ to deal with issues. One of such we mentioned the SOC, unforgiveness is a made you, you don't you cannot forgive your brother whom you have seen. How would you forgive God if you feel looks if Satan can convince you that God has offended you? So the reason why they gave us, and most of the New Testament is about the package of Christ, the personality of Christ, the message of Christ. You know what I mean? There's that dimension of God's sovereignty, but that Christ's purity, Christ is the pure heart to see God. You want to see God? Christ first. Amen. Amen. And Christ is not, you are not born again and have Christ like that. You are born again, you have Christ and get that. But when I, you might know what I mean, doctrine. My little children, whom I travel again. See what? Christ. My little children. Is, do you think unbelievers are his little children? No. It's we. It's believers that are his little children. I travel, my little, my little believers. I travel to Christ be formed in you. And when Christ is formed in you, the hope of glory. So I travel till Christ be formed in you. No man can see God except Christ. No man can see God at any time. Until Christ is formed in you, that's pure heart, then you can see God. So that's why most of the New Testament is emphasizing on Christ to wash our natures See, we have poverty mentality most of the time. That's our problem. Let's say promise offended me. Do you get what I mean? Very painful offense. It's clear. Anybody that I've told the story to, we agree that promise offended me. And people have gone to ask promise and promise say I didn't do anything. They are just be. You get what I mean? So that, yeah, and people come back and give me the feedback that he doesn't think he has done anything. He will now pain you more. But he said, this guy, why is God, and we are going to the same church. Why is it that this guy is not acknowledging the pain and the hurt and the cost that he has cost me? No, I will never forgive. Right? That's how many of us are like. I will never forgive. But God is now saying, see, if you can forgive him, I will open you up to eternal life, my life. So poverty mentality will say, no, I will keep fighting this little fight. You are fighting over five dollars when they are offering you five billion. That's the problem. That's our problem, really. We wrestle over petty things, though they are valuable. You know, it, okay, let me let's say it's not five dollars. Let's say it's one ten thousand dollars. Let me use ten thousand dollars. Because you know that this ten thousand dollars can buy you a car, you know that this ten thousand dollars can pay your mortgage, but they've not really told you. You don't see how this is worth five billion. It, I kid you not. Thirty years ago, if you showed me Facebook, I will not see how it's worth one trillion. And so I'll just put my profile here. What am I going to do with that? How is that going to help my life? <laughs> How am I going to make money of people individually putting their profile on a page? Who even does that? That doesn't make sense. Nobody will buy it. But now it's worth a trillion dollars. So initially, we don't ever think that it's worth it. People, do you know how many people have ideas 
There are people run by them every day and they're like, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Yet one of them may be the gold inside. Think about it. I used to always wonder, how does Facebook make their money? Because I just put my page and it's free. Everybody else is going to post their phrase and it's free. And they ask me to pay money. So is it that Mark Zuckerberg is a homeless guy? Until I realized I didn't have sense. And I realized that people pay money to put their ads so that I can see it. And all that money is entering his pocket. And the more of you that subscribe to Facebook, the more people put their ads there and the more money he makes. So but that concept of how do you monetize this concept didn't occur to me. That's how eternal life. How do I use it? How do, how do I profit with God's life? Because we are dull of hearing. Because we are ignorant. We don't know how to profit with God's life. We don't know that God's life makes all the difference. God has showed me mercy and showed it to me physically. I tell people, I used to be a stammerer. I used to, because of anxiety, my hands used to shake. If you come and be talking to me, you see my hands shaking like this. I'll be skipping words. Nobody laid hands on me. It was the word of life that did it. I can minister and talk before any kind of king now. Anybody from anywhere. No fear. It's God that did that. He showed me real hand. He can't profit. Should I tell you how he can profit again? If the word of life is in you and it gives you the confidence of grace and faith. I mean, what is this? It's just water. Where is this boy? He's going me $10,000. $10,000. Do you know how far I can go in life with $10,000? I will not let you go. I'll kill you. And as you are saying all those things, the guy who brought his blessing, he just <laughs> <laughs> I said, they, they don't need my blessing here. Thank you so much. I said that. Sorry, I refunded you small. That's why I chose you. You're a man. You get what I mean? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Are we understanding? The blessing. Keep your mind on the blessing. Nothing is worth it. No offense is worth it. No challenge is worth it. No situation is worth it to give up on the blessing, on the pursuit of the blessing. First, the revelation of Christ, which is called the unsearchable riches of Christ, and faith coming by hearing and hearing. All of these revelations, you come into a comprehension of it by hearing and hearing by the word. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, I read that again, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto who? His servant John. So what did John now say about it from John's side? So from Jesus' side, they call it the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. From John receiving it, what did they call it? Who bear record? He was writing what they were telling him. What well, record of what? The word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And of all things that they saw. From Genesis on to Revelation. They've never said this before. Is all the Bible not a blessing? But what are they now saying here? Verse 3. Blessed is he that read it. Amen. Blessed is who? He that read it. And they that what? Hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things. That are written therein. Is all the Bible not blessed that he that? I mean, there is blessing and there is blessing. Blessing, God, great. This is the blessing, the final blessing. 